and welcome to Vamp Blame It on the Internet. Yes, yes, Vamp survives and thrives. We are continuing to stream this show and others and even new content. And regardless of what happens with the openings and closings of public spaces like bars and restaurants, we are going to continue to stream our performances because it's been a lot of fun to see new viewers. We've been welcoming new friends from places like Oregon, Indiana, DC, and even the UK. So hello to all of you new viewers and hello to all of our regulars also. We've come a long way in 90 days, huh? I wanted to learn how to make sourdough from scratch and now I'm working on disbanding a police force. <laughs> we are in a kind of revolution right now and I know it can feel overwhelming. I want to thank everyone who is taking part in it and doing the work. We are in an extremely meaningful, powerful movement in the midst of a pandemic and man does that double the efforts. We are here with some wonderful stories tonight and they're going to remind us all of what life was like pre-COVID. It's still pretty isolating, not hanging out with people and not going out in public much. I've been abusing my body so much my vibrator filed for workers' comp. <laughs> I do feel though, as lonely as these times have been, that there is a new closeness in the zeitgeist. We have put up with corporations for a while now saying, we're all in this together. And that is just nauseating. But we so, so, so say we all feel that right now, at this point in time, we truly are in this moment in history together. We are listening, we are learning, we are trying, we are going to do better, and we are fighting for a safer and a more just society. We are hoping that tonight's showcase provides the briefest of respites before we all get back out there to fighting the good fight together with our masks on. Now, normally what we do at a regular vamp is ask for donations at the door, but we can't do that, so here's where I ask for them via the internet. If you're watching VAMP tonight, would you please do us a kindness and give $5 or more to So Say We All. You can go to sosayweall.wildapricot.org and leave us a donation and we'd surely appreciate it. Your money helps, our, helps keep our programming going strong. You can also become a member we'll, where you'll receive perks and we have a pretty big one coming up soon. So check out all the membership options. We really love our members and we're developing something really cool for them to happen in the coming months. So now please welcome your hardworking, awesome producer of tonight's show, the essential personnel of So Say We All, Miss Amanda Kassar. Greetings, pajama-wearing connoisseurs of excellent internet entertainment. Um, welcome to this June edition of VAMP. Uh, my name is Amanda Kassar, and I had the pleasure and the privilege of uh, working with these performers that you'll see tonight. Um, this is a very special sort of weird meta edition of VAMP. Um, the theme, decided before all this shit went down, uh, is blame it on the internet. Um, and here we are on the internet instead of at our blessed whistle stop. Uh, but it's okay, because I'm here with these performers, and you're here through the magic of the very entity that we're gathered here tonight to celebrate or perhaps condemn the internet. Uh, for those of you who may have just stumbled into this, uh, So Say We All is a San Diego literary and performing arts nonprofit their mission is to create opportunities for people to tell their stories and tell them better. They achieve this through the pursuit of three core priorities, publishing, performance, and education. Uh, they offer education outreach programs specifically targeting communities who lack access or are underrepresented by mainstream media. If you check out So Say We All's website, you'll see all their fantastic partnerships and their books for sale. 
Um, I delivered my first vamp for the After the Disaster theme almost three years ago in July of 2017. All I knew at the time was I had this story inside of me that was huge and messy and traumatic, and the theme spoke to me. It gave me permission to narrow in on one smaller aspect of a very big jumble of feelings. Uh, it was really therapeutic and also very gratifying. Since then, I've been delighted to be part of this community that's sorely needed in San Diego. Um, it's a place that creates space and respect for the true things that happen to us all, both the really wild stories and also the more mundane things. That old phrase from Socrates, the unexamined life is not worth living, rings true to me. After going through the rigorous but very enjoyable processes of crafting a vamp story, um, if you're wondering how crafting a vamp story works, the submission process is blind. We read your stories blind and choose the ones we think have the most potential. Uh, you'll get one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, from a writing and performance coach, and you go through critique sessions with your fellow performers. Um, so that said, any of you out there can do this. Um, at the end of the show, I'm going to pitch next month's theme to you uh, in hopes that you may think about dashing something off for us in the next few days. But back to tonight, in these stories that explore the effects the internet has had on our storytellers, you may notice a unifying thread. Yes, the internet can be an awful place, the desert of the real, as it were. <laughs> you need not go far into cyberspace to expose sticky veins of human ugliness. But the internet can also be a powerfully creative space to remake and revise our realities. So with that, I would like to introduce our performers tonight. We have Rory Kelly. <laughs> Kiyomi Shaba, who is a first time vamper. <laughs> Dallas McLaughlin, <laughs> veteran. Florence Sarah Pollard, <laughs> Brienne Hayes, <laughs> and the indomitable Brent Hanafee. <laughs> so with that, please welcome Rory Kelly to the stage. It's December 2018, and about eight days before the new year begins. I'm lying in bed, staring at the ceiling, and one thought keeps reverberating around the inside of my skull, like a devilish, hyperkinetic tennis ball. I suck. <laughs> this is not an uncommon thought. Most nights begin with an epic amount of self-flagellation, as the day's stressors and anxieties coalesce into an organism of shame and defeat. I know myself well enough to know that this mental cobweb of negative self-talk will, most of the time, evaporate with the rising sun, like dew on blades of grass, except the dew is toxic sludge, and the blades of grass are shards of used hypodermic needles. <laughs> this night's bout of negativity comes from a sudden realization. I'm 32, and I haven't accomplished anything. Now, even in my half-asleep state, I can counter this pretty easily. I've accomplished stuff. I have a great marriage, a secure career, good friends, ties to the community, and a respectable mid-sized car with a backup camera that I'm steadily paying off. <laughs> so there, nightly toxic do, I am doing okay. <laughs> yeah, the voice says, but aren't you a little, a lot, unhappy? Don't you feel unfulfilled? And I try to fight back and say, no, I'm fine. But when, the voice says, was the last time you actually completed a creative project? Ah, damn it. This is the one-two punch that my inner bully knows is a knockout. The logical side of my brain has no retort or defense for this. How many ideas have you jotted down in various notebooks? Have you developed any of them? Have you completed any of them? Have you submitted anything in the past three months, the past year? How can you call yourself a creative person if you're not being creative? 
You're a fraud, a rapidly approaching middle-aged fraud. You have a career, screw you. You're a hobbyist at best. This is the spiral. It sucks, but honestly what works best for me when the spiral is really going is to let it burn itself out like a hurricane that dies before it makes landfall. I fall asleep, but the next morning the dew doesn't evaporate. Last night's beating sticks with me. Maybe I am a fraud. Maybe if I had invested time into creative pursuits, I'd be in a better place. Maybe I am just a hobbyist. I need to prove the nightly toxic do voice wrong. I need to move on just beyond just daydreaming. With 2019 just around the corner, it is a perfect time for resolutions, which I normally hate, but maybe finally understand the purpose of. The first question I ask myself is, what do I want to do? Gun to head, six months left to, have, left to live, what do I actually want to do? Get serious. My brain spins through the options. Write the great American novel, craft some short stories, buy script writing software and do my best Aaron Sorkin impression. <laughs> Ultimately though, I kept arriving back at one idea, comics. I love comics. Like comic book stores have been my safe space since I was about nine years old. I have more opinions on the various alter egos of Robin than I do about most modern political issues. And before I was even into comic books, I was into comic strips. The Sunday Funnies were my Bible. Garfield, my patron saint. Calvin and Hobbes offered more life philosophies than, well, the real John Calvin and Thomas Hobbes. <laughs> so in 2019, I present myself a challenge. Use my barely burgeoning doodling skills to create a new comic strip every single day. 365 days straight, no excuses, no apologies, just create something post it to Instagram, and do it publicly. One pretty major problem, I can't really draw. As a kid, I would try to draw the flash, and for reasons entirely related to my inability to translate physicality to line work, one of his arms always ended up wrapped around his torso like an appendage scarf. But I can't let the toxic knight do win, so I thought of advice a friend once gave me. Do something. And if you suck at it, do it again the next day, and you'll suck less. <laughs> Creating comics would qui quiet the toxic night do voice in my brain. It would make me feel more satisfied. It would make me happier. So I set to work. I create a public Instagram account as well as my private one. I use a basic drawing program on an iPad Pro and aim to create. Just make something, anything. Just make it happen. The whole point is the posting, not the numbers or followers or likes or anything that could actually impact my psyche. Just post stuff. And always remember that if it sucks, I can always try again tomorrow. Growth is key. Personal, creative, healthy growth. That's it. That's all that matters. But this is social media we're talking about, so that didn't last long. There are three numbers at the top of every Instagram post. Posts, followers, and following. Now, as much as we may all deny it, we all want two of these numbers to stay low and one of them to be very, very high. We all want a large audience. We want to appear like we don't want a large audience, so we don't want to look like we want a large audience. But that's what we want, just to be clear, including me. I'm as desperate for attention as anyone, but at this point, I'm not willing to admit it. So I have two accounts, the private Instagram and the public. I don't tell anyone from the private about the public because I'm genuinely interested in seeing how the two audiences will differentiate. It's like an experiment, control group, private IG, and varial group, public IG. The same comics are published to both. For the first month or so, the comics on the private earn more likes than the comics on the public. This is nice. I'm glad to see my friends are responding to them. Let's be clear, I don't have a ton of followers on the private account. It is mostly other writers and some coworkers. So something like 12 likes is considered a good day. But around the second month, a curious thing happens. Maybe it, is the, is the, maybe it is the judicious use of hashtags, or maybe the comics just got better, but the public account is suddenly a thing. Not a big thing, mind you. I mean, if a comic gets 10 on the private and 14 on the public, that's hardly notable. But I noticed, and I feel good, and I feel the itch. In the third, fourth, and fifth month of 2019, the public account is doing surprisingly well. Better than I ever thought. It sometimes gets triple-digit likes on posts, and my engagement stats are way up. I try to put it in perspective, but I can't deny I feel really good. And the itch 
grows. Around the sixth month, I break 3,000 followers in the public account, and one post breaks 10,000 likes. What in the actual hell is happening? <laughs> sure, a lot of those followers are, for some reason, from India, but like, whatever, right? Numbers are numbers, right? And the itch becomes a full-born rash. I become entirely obsessed with the numbers. I constantly refresh the public page, feeling a gross sense of satisfaction as the likes tick upward. Screw lying awake at night, comparing myself to others. Forget feeling envious of those who achieved some level of success. Whatever to being creative, I am popular. <laughs> and it's the first time in my life I can say that. Screw nightly worries, I have numbers to prove my worth. It is summer of 2019 when things start to change. Fourth of July and my wife and I are enjoying a weekend of swimming, barbecuing, and watching Will Smith movies. But I'm not fully present. I think I have a good strip, one with a wise-cracking firecracker. And so, my routine of refreshing the strip every hour dominates my attention. But damn, this thing is sluggish! Nowhere near the numbers I was expecting. It just languishes in the ether of the holiday weekend like a flaccid American flag bandana tied haphazardly to a sweaty dad's forehead. <laughs> I try to brush it off. Just a holiday weekend slump, right? Nobody checks their phone on the 4th, right? Like, everyone's drunk or whatever, right? Despite my mental protestations, over the next month, the numbers slip. The follower account plateaus and the hashtag stop producing likes. I keep posting because I made a goal, and I want to be able to say that I had done something, that I had proof that I am not just a hobbyist, that I can create and see ideas through to their ultimate forms. But there is a lingering feeling of futility. I, regardless, I feel a sense of loss, of frustration. Was the nightly toxic do right this whole time? Did I really, actually suck? Was the pre-sleep hell chant not just anxiety and exhaustion, but my own inner Simon Cowell warning me not to embarrass myself in front of others? <laughs> What have I done wrong? Why am I losing my audience? Have I created something patently offensive or stupid or dorky? I do my own research into what is happening. I learn more about the chaotic neutral force known as the Instagram algorithm. Apparently the algorithm is, crack Apparently the algorithm is cracking down on bots. Some bots are easy to spot. They're the ones who message you and invite you to a private chat so you can see their hot, sexy pictures, big boy. <laughs> Other bots are less obvious. And according to my research, many bots come from bot farms in India. So it's entirely possible that my meteoric rise contains inflated numbers, which anecdotal evidence supports. But unfortunately, my self-worth is largely tied to those numbers. And the numbers are low, so the self-flagellation returns with a vengeance. I remind myself of the original mission statement of this whole project. Just create. All growth is good, right? But the numbers are hard to ignore. Despite my right brain's attempted encouragement, my left brain has data and analytics to prove the night chant true. Indeed, I suck. The past year has been a lie. Well, maybe not a lie, but it was definitely complicated, and I'm not sure what I'm supposed to learn from it. I wrap up my daily experiment in December of 2019. I created, wrote, drew, and posted 354 comics, just 11 shy of one a day. I feel... I feel fine, you know, good, like, I did what I set out to do, pretty much, and that's, that's cool. And so I go to bed, I close my eyes, and I hear a, a voice, a familiar voice, start a familiar chant. You suck. I open my eyes, I stare at the ceiling, I realize this was never about followers, engagement stats, or algorithms, it's about my own brain, and wanting to be free of the feelings of worthlessness that lull me to sleep. What if I don't let the voice spiral? What if I talk back? What if I stand up for, m for myself against myself? So I fight back. I don't suck. I'm creative and learning. I'll keep trying. And maybe someday I'll suck less. Thank you so much. eight years old, this credible invention called the internet allowed me to watch an unfamiliar sport called synchronized swimming in the Olympics. I sat cross-legged in front of our bulky television, eyes wide as tall girls with silky legs and shiny hair danced across the water. That, I said, I want to do that. 
As a child who had dabbled in mainstream activities such as soccer and softball, but chose to stick with Irish dancing, mostly because there weren't flying balls involved, it's not surprising I fell in love with another off-brand sport. Synchro began as a small commitment, about three days a week for two hours a day. I loved it. My coach bubbled with excitement every practice, and our routine song, which is the same for the whole year-long season, was from, Chick from the Chicken Little movie. We even had Chicken Little on our costume suits. My teammates quickly became my closest friends, and competitions were spent playing in the sun and binging on nachos from the snack bar. Our short routine was simple, and my coach said the most important thing was to smile and have fun. The only downside was how we had to do our hair. A tight bun stuffed with bobby pins with Knox gelatin coating our heads. After meets, I stood in the shower for hours picking out every last piece of jello from my hair. As the years went by, the commitment grew. Weird phrases began to enter my vocabulary. Like when a coach wanted our sculling to be smooth, she'd say, and now we're going to smear peanut butter on the bottom of the pool. <laughs> and if we had to get higher out of the water in our splits, she'd yell, try to get your crotch dry. <laughs> Three days of practice turn into five days, and then six days, and then seven. Two hour practices stretch to three hours, and five on Saturdays. As a shy middle schooler, Synchro gave me a place to belong. When everyone at school was talking about soccer or football, I would proudly think, well, I'm a synchronized swimmer, and I bet I have to practice more than you do. Synchro made me different, and I liked it. When I was 14, about six years into this venture, something happened. I won an event at a big meet. After years of being wonderfully average, I was actually good at synchronized swimming. Younger teammates began looking up to me and coaches started noticing me. I tried out for the national team, passing a skills testing which included tasks like V-ups, push-ups, planks, headstands, and flexibility testing. I qualified in the top 20 nationally in the 13-15 age group, and after that, synchro truly became my entire life. My coaches began giving me workouts and stretches to do at home, and my parents took me to a stretching specialist to increase my flexibility. One of the exercises from my coaches was working on toe point using a hollowed out circular piece of rubber hooked on the top of the foot and back of the heel that first forced the feet into a perfect point. It was the best exercise they gave me because I could sit in front of the TV and watch a show until my feet went numb. <laughs> After months of training and a long weekend of final tryouts at Stanford, the top 12 athletes would compete for the country. I finished 17th. I was disappointed, but not heartbroken. Being on the national team meant giving up my summer and likely doing online school the following year so I could train with the team in Northern California. Now, as a freshman in high school, my priorities had begun to change like deciding what to wear for the choir show and talking to the guy across from me in math. But I couldn't stop doing synchro. I just had a breakthrough and I'd been dreaming of competing at college since I was 10. So many girls quit during high school and I had to be one of the ones that made it through. Quitting wasn't even part of my vocabulary. But synchro practices began to feel longer and routines became harder. Practices were peppered with my coach comparing me and my duet partner, calling one of us the weak link or the bottom of the barrel, or me, or yelling at me for not trying hard enough when I was doing the best that I possibly could. Our duet routine began with a long hybrid, an upside down leg sequence requiring nose plugs and excessive sculling to keep our body bodies above the water, which left me gasping for air 30 seconds in. The entire four minute routine felt like I was one step away from drowning, and yet I still had to perform, all while wearing a sparkly sequin suit, 50 million bobby pins, obnoxiously bright eyeshadow, perfectly winged eyeliner, and Knox gelatin in my hair. The exhaustion I felt was constantly hidden by a dazzling smile, which became an automatic reflex. 
After that year, my parents, coach, and I collectively decided I would benefit from switching teams from my hometown squad in San Diego to a more select team in Riverside who boasted award-winning coaches. This meant spending my afternoons and nights, four to five days a week, in the back seat of our red Toyota van, getting car sick from the combination of AP Euro reading homework and Rubio's bean and cheese burritos, <laughs> with my dad trying in earnest to support me while entertaining himself by playing podcasts relevant to my challenging history class. On a Saturday only one month into this switch, I woke up in tears. I didn't want to go to practice. I didn't want to hear our dramatic electro routine music for two hours, and I didn't want to sit through yet another one of my coach's speeches about why we needed to try harder. Most new routines came with a new coach, new music, and sometimes new teammates, but the phrase, you have to try 110% or you're not trying, never changed. <laughs> but my parents had just purchased all the new team gear, and it would be embarrassing to back out so soon. Six months later, I was still stuffing burritos down my throat in the back of the family van, dreading yet another three-hour practice bookended by insults and deranged coaching strategies of forcing all of the swimmers to stay after practice and swim 300 yards of butterfly because one girl did her tabletop position wrong. We arrived unceremoniously early to the dinky community pool that housed practice, which was really just a deep, cemented, oversized pond. My duet partner arrived and we both silently laid out our towels and began stretching while our coach set up the sound system at the deep end of the pool. We use an underwater speaker, which is for hearing the routine music underwater, but really acts as a way for the coach to yell at us even when we're upside down. <laughs> this team was run by two coaches, an intrepid mother-daughter duo, and on this day the mom, a skinny, serious 60-year-old woman, ran our practice. My duet partner and I continued stretching until our coach called us over to begin land drilling, which means practicing our routine on land. This is something that happens virtually every practice and involves continuous counting to the music and fake smiles. Five, six, seven, eight. Louder! Five, six, seven, eight. Kiyomi, louder! My cheeks burned from the forced smile dragged across my lips, but I tried to count louder. I couldn't. It was like my smile was a mask clamp clamped over my mouth, leaving my voice stuck in my throat. Kiyomi, if you do not start counting louder, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. My coach stopped the music, and I turned around, suddenly petrified. She was crying, not leaking tears, but legitimately sobbing about how I had disrespected her and must leave the pool deck right now. She made me call my mother to tell her I was raised poorly and I'm a terrible person and that she was sending me home. And because of my act of disrespect, she would no longer be accompanying us to the qualifying meet that weekend. I left the deck with my swim bag, shame, and tears. I explained the situation to my dad and we drove two hours home. He was more confused than anything. So was I. The site of the meet that weekend was Moraga, California. As promised, the crying coach was nowhere to be found, but her daughter gave me dirty looks during the entire warm-up. We had the first day of competition consisting of figures, which are uniform exercises every swimmer does individually, which contribute to the team's score. Figures should be executed with as much extension, flexibility, height, and slowness as possible. Since every athlete in the entire meet goes through four skills where the goal is to go as slow as humanly possible, the figures portion of the meets takes an astonishingly long, long amount of time. That night, we were holed up at a Motel 6 to prepare for the routine competition the following day. We had done our hair already, which meant tight ponytails wrapped into buns stuffed with painful bobby pins, then painted with that infamous Knox gelatin that had to dry before we entered the pool the next day. The Motel 6 tension was already high when the current coach brought us into her small room for a talk. Talks are generally not a good thing. She began by saying how she felt a lack of commitment from us as swimmers, and then transitioned to asking, are you committed to competing at nationals? I recalled the day six months prior when a pit of pre-practice dread made a home in my stomach. But I still dragged myself to practice every day because... Why? Because my duet partner needed me? Nope. She'd been fantasizing about quitting the whole season. 
because I needed to make my parents' investment worth it? Maybe, but I knew they'd want me to be happy above anything else. No, I forced myself to practice because I didn't know who I was without Synchro. Eight years of training and competing flashed before my eyes with the identity of an athlete being so strongly rooted as a part of me. But the passion for Synchro had broken a long time ago and it was time for me to be brave. No, I said, I don't think I can commit to competing at nationals. And just like that, I quit the sport that had shaped my life. That night in the hotel room, I laid awake. Mostly because the Knox gelatin in my hair had hardened and was pulling on my scalp, but also because I had just taken the biggest risk of my young life. After years of watching coaches drive myself and my teammates to tears, I had looked my coach in the eyes and told her, no, I'm done. And that's pretty badass. <laughs> but I had quit the one thing that I identified with most that made me unique. Staring into blackness at the, on the creaky Motel 6 bed, my brain did flips trying to decide if I had made the right decision. Amongst the nostalgic memories of chicken little sequins and endless nachos making me feel insecure about quitting, one very comforting thought kept recurring. I would never have to sleep with rock hard jello in my hair again. <laughs> Thank you. About a decade ago, I attended a friend's second wedding. I only bring up that it was his second wedding because I had been the MC at his first. I had one of the better lines at the reception when I welcomed everyone to the very nice hotel's very large ballroom by saying, welcome to the 2002 Independent Spirit Awards. <laughs> one person laughed very loudly. <laughs> the second wedding was very different. It was held at a boutique hotel. The ceremony was by a pool and it had a theme, Mad Men. There was no MC this time around, but there was a 90s cover band made up of my two best friends. One played guitar, the other cajon, and they actually were very successful around San Diego for a few years. They called themselves Fever Crotch. <laughs> the bride and groom had gone on a date to see them play one time, so they asked them to play the reception under a different name, of course. <laughs> the wedding was short, and the reception was a damn delight. There were dessert trays everywhere, none of this wedding cake bullshit appetizer stations, and of course, an open bar. Which, by the way, if you don't have an open bar at your wedding, fuck you. <laughs> You're a bad person. Please understand that outside of your immediate family, no one wants to go to your wedding to see you get married. No one. The only reason they're there is to get free drinks and free food. Please don't be an asshole and make people pay for drinks and don't have a dry wedding. Holy shit. Unless someone in your family died of alcoholism, and even then, it's a toss-up. I mean, they're not gonna fall off the wagon. <laughs> Anyway, this wedding had an open bar, and I took full advantage. Fever Crotch asked me to come up and sing Bust a Move, which I'm very good at, like uncomfortably good at. When I was done, I walked over to grab a tower of desserts when I was approached by the photographer, who was also an old friend and I hadn't seen in a while. We chatted for a few minutes, and she asked if I would check out her photography page on Facebook. I said I would, and later that night when I got home, I did in fact check out her Facebook page. I'm a mad man of my word. After a few minutes, I kept noticing this one girl who was in a lot of the photographs. And naturally, being a single 30-year-old man at the time, I began the process of Facebook stalking this girl. <laughs> and here's the thing. This girl was beautiful, like a model beautiful. And that's probably because she was a model. <laughs> I've always been one to punch outside my weight class, which at this point could be described as Taco Bell. But at this moment, even I was like, hold on, champ, she is out of your league in the sense that she's on the field playing the game and you're up in the nosebleeds and you're not a person, you're a seat and you smell like beer farts. <laughs> so like all men of legend, I messaged her blindly. And then like a moron, I asked if we knew each other. She replied saying that she didn't think so because of course we didn't and she wasn't an idiot. <laughs> However, she said she noticed we had some mutual friends and then accepted my friend request. Things were happening. I immediately messaged the photographer from the wedding and asked about this model friend of hers who would one day probably unfriend me. 
However, I was determined to try. I hadn't dated anyone in three years. I was happy with that, very happy. I mean, my life was great. I had just come home from eating free tiny eclairs and rapping an 80s hip hop song at a wedding while dressed like a dying Don Draper. <laughs> Things were solid, but I couldn't get this woman out of my head. This time, something was different. The photographer told me she was a great person and we'd be great together and I should go for it. And I mean, who doesn't trust a wedding photographer? <laughs> the model's name was Samantha, Sam. And we started messaging back and forth, then texting, and then I finally got the courage to ask her out. The plan was to go see the movie Inception, and it had just, been, and it had just come out. At the time, we both worked in theater, which meant we were never available till late at night. So the only time that worked for us was a 10.40 p.m. showing. We got tickets, and the lady at the door told us, you know, this movie's three hours long. No, we didn't know the movie was three hours long. But she seemed fine with it, and I just wanted to be where she was. When we sat in the theater, I went into full-blown performer mode. I was slinging jokes, impressions, whipping out my best anecdotes, doing anything I could to appear interesting. At first, I thought everything was going well, but then I got nervous. She crossed her leg away from me. That's a sign she's not interested, right? But then again, by doing that, she pushed her body closer to me, so really she wants to be closer, right? Right? <laughs> I was convincing myself that I was screwing it all up. When you're not the best-looking guy in the world, you really have to rely on charm. At this point in my life, I was over 260 pounds, so my charm was thick. <laughs> this led to an at times debilitating combination of unchecked confidence and uncanny anxiety. When the charm seemed to have little effect, my anxiety kicked in in the form of a little voice in my head. What is she doing here with you? She's beautiful. How old is she? She seems young. You're old. <laughs> you should just get up and leave. But also, you should put your arm around her. No! Just save both of you the awkwardness of her rejecting you and leave immediately. It makes no sense that she would date you. You look like all the members of the shins put together. <laughs> Try to hold her hand. The only thing I did end up doing was actually just staring at her hand for about two hours. I was very slick. We walked out of the theater at about 1.30 a.m. and I turned to ask how she liked and she was yawning. A big yawn, like a fuck you yawn. <laughs> I was sure that I had screwed it all up, but after her yawn, she said, you want to go to Denny's? We went and we stayed till 3.30 in the morning. We talked about Denny's menu items for way too long. She ordered mozzarella sticks, bold choice. <laughs> I think I just ordered coffee, because when you're a bigger guy, anything you put in your mouth is questioned. We talked about our lives, our jobs, our futures. Of course, we'd already been doing this for weeks on Facebook, but now, now it was real. I could actually see what made her laugh, what made her confused, and what made her smile. I could hear in person just how smarter than me she was. I could tell that she was better than me, and therefore, I had to be with her forever. <laughs> a few days later, I asked her to go to Julian with me. She said yes. A long drive to a small town was a bold ass for a second date, but I felt confident. We walked around all the shops. We ate at the Julian Cafe, where I made dumb characters out of the salt shaker and the creamer. Sergeant Salt and Captain Creamer retired who both tried to convince her to be my girlfriend. Again, performer mode was in full effect, and instead of thinking I was being obnoxious, mainly because Captain Creamer sounded like this, and Sergeant Salt was inexplicably British, she just laughed. When we walked out of the restaurant, I went to hold her hand. She declined. I died a thousand deaths. The voice, see, I told you, she hates you. The Creamer bit was dumb and you smell like chalupas. She said she didn't really hold hands, something I'd later find out was bullshit, but in the moment also sounded like bullshit. <laughs> I pressed on. We got back to my house and we kissed. Quite a step up from hand holding, but what did I know about dating these days? A few nights later, she came with me to see Fever Crotch. I got up to seeing Busta Move because I had to prove my worth as a potential life partner. We left the bar and I asked her if she would be my girlfriend. She said yes, then asked how old I was. We had never talked about it. She was 21. I was 30. I was old, but she already had health insurance, so it balanced out. The voice inside my head would seem to disappear when I was with her. In fact, my mom used to comment that I seemed at ease when I was around her, which I replied was because of my blood pressure meds. The need to overcompensate because of my inability to see good in myself was being washed away because she did see it without a qualifier. We were engaged a year later, in Julian, on the same corner where she refused to hold my hand. Most of the people I knew would see us together and marvel at the huge mistake Sam was about to make. 
In fact, most people didn't quite understand how this had worked out to begin with, and I was fine with that. It was best that no one asked too many questions. You don't want to spook the horses. <laughs> Yes, she's very pretty. Yes, she's much younger than me. Yes, I'll die first. That's part of the plan. <laughs> we planned our wedding for September as we were broke, and we learned that's one of the cheapest months to get married. Who knew? Apparently, most people. <laughs> it was in the middle of nowhere in the woods, a small venue that warned people not to use any kind of Google Maps or GPS system, as it would just lead you to a lake. <laughs> Neither one of us are particularly religious, so I asked one of my best friends to be our officiant. He was so happy, he immediately went out and got ordained by the firstuniversalistchurch.com. He pe peppered his speech with lines like, Do you, Sam, take Dallas to be your lawfully wedded husband as long as he shall live? <laughs> and compared how much more popular Sam's maiden name was to my last name as a symbol of the significant step down Sam was taking. It was great. Instead of a unity candle or some nonsense, we made a unity iced coffee and had our officiant and a woman from the crowd sing Almost Paradise from Footloose as we made our Unity Ice Coffee. It was an honest-to-God blast, mainly because we had an open bar. <laughs> as the night started to come to a close, Sam definitely looked worn out. I started packing leftover beer into the trunk to take to our hotel. Since we were in the woods, we couldn't do goodbye sparklers, and they very much discouraged rice or anything like that that the birds could eat and then explode. <laughs> So we had our friends and family wish us well with a dance tunnel. We're very fun people. <laughs> we got into the car and I immediately got nervous. I was sure I had just convinced this woman to make a gigantic mistake. This woman I had met on Facebook of all places. This woman I had used all my drunken Irish charms to woo. That mean, anxiety-driven voice started blabbering in my head so loud I couldn't shake it. I looked forward and I saw a dark road lit by stars ahead and I cleared my mind as best I could. I started the car and turned to see my newly wedded wife yawning, a big yawn. Before I could inexplicably apologize for what I didn't know, she cut me off and asked, you want to stop and get burritos? <laughs> I did. We did. Thanks. I am the youngest of five children. Inevitably, at the start of every school year at Linda Vista Elementary School in Pasadena, California in the 1960s, you would find me sitting at my desk in my new class, bright, happy, wanting to do well, always early. Once settled in, the teacher would begin roll call, my last name being Pollard. I was in the second half of attendance checking. I would wait in anticipation, excited to have my new teacher acknowledge my existence. When my geriatric teacher would say, Florence Pollard, I would raise my little hand and say, here. Pollard? Yes. Florence Pollard? Yes. Are you related to John, Jared, Ray, and Madeline? <laughs> yes. I would say, now shrinking down in my seat, my thoughts of doing well and being a teacher's favorite, becoming a distant memory. The teacher, cursing her bad luck, would say, No, not another Pollard. Please, not another Pollard. The next question right on schedule seemed to be, Are there any more of you? <laughs> no, would be my answer, followed by a not-so-quiet mumbling under the teacher's breath. Thank goodness. In my second grade, Mrs. Harrison, or Harry Harrison, as she was known on the playground, most likely one of my siblings giving her the derogatory name, actually announced to the class after uncovering my identity, no, I won't have another Pollard in my class. This could have been the result of when my brother Ray boxed up and gift wrapped a dead rat for one of the teacher's aides. <laughs> or maybe when my sister Madeline punched her fourth grade teacher in the face. But to be fair, back in the day when it was your birthday, Teachers would festively bring students to the front of the class and spank them once for every year of their age. On my sister's birthday, she wanted nothing to do with this little tradition, hence the punch in the face. Possibly, Harry Harrison wanted to remember her last year teaching as an easy one and would not be taking any chances. She had me move to another class that day, relieved to be rid of another Pollard. Smog or not, the best time of day, hands down, was recess for me. One day, 
In first grade, another official smog alert had a six-year-old relegated to playing inside the auditorium at recess. It was basically against the law for teachers to let us play outside during a smog alert. Not uncommon with the hideous air quality in Pasadena in the early 1960s. We were told we'd be playing games. What kid doesn't love games? Once in the auditorium, the teacher told us to imitate our favorite animal. Mine being an elephant, I quickly clasped my hands together, intertwining my fingers while throwing my straight arms up in the air. I was extremely excited and enjoying this fun and playful game. I knew the louder I was, the better elephant I became. I was taken by surprise when my trunk was being violently gripped and shaken. Florence, stop this instant. What is that terrible noise you're making? I explained to the teacher that my favorite animal was an elephant, hoping this explanation would make it obvious. With a look of disgust, she explained that I sounded horrible and looked ridiculous. Why can't you be more like Erica? Erica, always a teacher favorite, clean, pretty dresses, perfectly combed hair with a headband and a cute barrette, compared to me with my hand-me-downs, buck teeth, and my at-home bowl haircut. I had no choice but to look over at Erica because the teacher had clamped both her hands over my ears and turned my head in the direction of Erica. Perfect Erica, skipping in a wide circle, making little high, light hoof clicking noises with her tongue. It was obvious she was a majestic galloping horse. Now look at that, Florence, and try, just try to be more like Erica. Something was cast over me that day, a deep and long lasting blow to my self-esteem. The be more like Erica, not your sad, sorry, not good enough self kind of blow. This came from an ancient, wrinkled old woman who I was taught to respect because she meant business. As the years went by, I'd often wonder, whatever happened to my childhood friend Erica? With social media and the internet, it should not have been too difficult to track her down. The problem was I had no idea how to spell her last name. Many years would go by without my ever thinking about her until I saw that there was a Linda Vista gang group page set up on Facebook. It was representing my old Pasadena elementary school. I quickly joined the group. It's been great fun reconnecting with old friends and seeing class photos. Then it happened. Someone picked Erica out of our first grade photo. The post went something like this. Does anyone know whatever happened to Erica Recton? There it was, the tricky spelling of her last name, R-E-C-H-T-I-N. With absolutely no preconceived notions, I copy-pasted the correct spelling of her name into a simple Google search, wondering if I would soon be able to figure out whatever happened to my perfect little friend Erica, who completely unbeknownst to her was the subject of the brutal self-esteem blow put on me so many years ago. Would she be living a quiet life in Poughkeepsie with her three poodles? Possibly doing 25 to life in Leavenworth? <laughs> My search resulted in quickly finding her father's very impressive obituary. At the end it stated, survived by his children, including Erica Recton Bauermeister. My first thought was, well, her married name was a mouthful. That's a good start. <laughs> I then copy-pasted her full name into another Google search, and immediately there it was, Erica Bauermeister's bio. Erica Bauermeister, PhD. Of course she was a PhD. <laughs> married to the love of her life for over 30 years with two wonderful children, one boy, one girl. Of course. <laughs> Successful author of the New York Times bestseller, the School of Essential Ingredients, which has been translated into 10 languages. Wow, just wow. <laughs> My first thought, misguided as it might have sound today, was, well, the old hag was right. I guess teaching elementary schoolers for 30 plus years is bound to give you some sort of insight as to who a child will grow up to be. My friend Erica and I traveled just about the most opposite life paths that any two people who started out in the same elementary school classrooms could have. While Erica headed off into academia, at 16, I moved to Hawaii with my surfer boyfriend. 
Much like Harry Harrison's second grade move, my father okayed my move to Maui when I was 16 and facilitated it by making my 19-year-old boyfriend my legal guardian, relieved he would be, not be dealing with another rebellious teenager. Recently, I ran across the notarized document dated August 27, 1976. It reads, to whom it may concern, I, John K. Pollard, father of Florence Sarah Pollard, whose birth is described below, willingly consent to allow Peter Matthew Powell, surfer, to act as her legal guardian <laughs> during her residence in Lahaina, Hawaii, as long as she is enrolled in and maintains a satisfactory academic record at Lahaina Luna High School. Against the odds, I did manage to graduate. My own writing started very late in life. After secretly dreaming of being a writer for years, I finally convinced myself to just say fuck it and get my stories down on paper. Turns out the stories all true have been well received. I do sometimes wonder though, if I'd even had a pinprick of encouragement from anyone at all, or if educators would have known what dyslexia was back in the 60s, my life would be a little different now. I'm not complaining. I have, despite the odds, managed to carve out a good life for myself with wisdom, loyalty, determination, and reliability, much like the honorable elephant. My many misadventures have given me some great stories and very thick skin. Suffice it to say, Erica Bauermeister, like the horse with its power, grace, beauty, and freedom, likely had a bit more support and encouragement coming her way than I did, but good for her. No doubt Erica has worked ridiculously hard and is quite talented. My hat goes off to her. Her newest book, The Scent Keeper, was Reese Witherspoon's February Book of the Month Club choice. <laughs> of course it was. <laughs> Through social media, I reintroduced myself to Erica and invited her to join our Linda Vista Gang Facebook group. Erica joined and posted graciously, it's great to see these old photos and memories now. I was just saying the other day that I don't remember much from this time in my life. I wish I could say the same, but we all know that an elephant never forgets. Her name was Allison, and she was nothing like me. Tall, slender, and covered in toned muscle. Straight, silky black hair that fell to her waist. Big, shimmering brown eyes. A round, pale, freckled face. She was flirty and aloof, but whip-smart when she needed to be. And most importantly, she was always bored and in search of companionship. Allison and I couldn't be less alike, and that was exactly how I intended her to be. Allison was the persona I invented to use on Omegle, a website that connects you with a completely random stranger for text-only chat. It's like chat roulette, but without the webcams. For most people, Omegle was a website whose novelty would wear off after two or three awkward, dead-end conversations. But for a closeted, genderqueer without, gender without knowing it teenager, Omegle was a laboratory, the only place where it felt safe to experiment with my identity. I was in high school, living as, presenting as, and fully believing myself to be a man. At the time, I assumed that the self-hatred and bodily discomfort that I experienced every day were symptoms of the run-of-the-mill depression, rather than signs of gender dysphoria. The few dates I had were with women, and I felt no attraction towards men. If questioned, I would have told you that I couldn't have been more comfortable with my sexuality. Yet, when I logged onto Omegle for the first time, I introduced myself not as a misanthropic teenage boy, but as a bored, friendly 20-something woman. Since communication was exclusively text-based, pretending to be something I wasn't was no problem at all. On Omegle, just as in most corners of the internet, one tended to find more men than women. A lot more men. Like, almost exclusively men. <laughs> the severity of this gender imbalance created a culture where randomly being paired with a woman felt like winning the lottery, and men would bend over backwards to keep the attention of any woman they were thrust into contact with. If you googled Omegle, you would quickly stumble across articles with creepy, desperate titles like How to Find Girls on Omegle or How to Talk to Girls on Omegle. <laughs> In this environment, being female meant being desirable. And when you're a teenager, you can go to some extreme lengths to feel wanted. Sure, I was pretending to be a woman on the internet, but at least people wanted to talk to me for once. I was quick to figure out the weird ways by which the denizens of Omegle communicated with one another. The customary greeting was not hello or what's up, but rather ASL, short for age, sex, and location. 
While the location was often left out, it was pretty much impossible to begin a conversation until you knew about how old the other person was and what kind of genitals they had. You ask people for their ASL to figure out how to relate to them in the absence of the normal visual cues that tell us how to judge people in real life. Allison's ASL was 24F SoCal. I made her a few years, few years older than myself and kept her location vague enough that I could pretend she was somewhere else in the rare event that someone asked about meeting up. Part of Omega culture was to accept pretty much anything the other person told you. They would believe, they would believe I was an attractive 24-year-old woman, and I would believe they were 6'2". <laughs> Though it was considered rude, some men would insist on protecting their masculinity by demanding that I provide proof of my femininity, read timestamp nudes, I immediately disconnected from anyone who asked for pictures. While experimenting with my gender in real life felt like an invitation for rejection or even violence, Omegle gave me the safety of being able to dismiss any uncomfortable conversation with a single button press. But most people that I talked to believed me when I said that I was a woman, and this trust allowed me to flesh out my feminine persona. Over the years that I pretended to be Allison on Omegle, I got to know who she was better, I got to know who she was almost as well, and perhaps better, than I knew myself, especially her appearance. While I avoided looking at myself in the mirror as much as possible, the men I talked to online were much more interested in Allison's looks than her personality. And after a while, I was able to effortlessly reel off paragraphs describing her in microscopic detail. I made her beautiful because that's what the men wanted, but she was not a supermodel or a movie star. She was more like your attractive coworker who doesn't stun you on first sight, but whose appearance only grows more pleasant the more time you spend around them. She was office hot, basically. Um, she was beautiful, but in a way that felt believable and attainable. She let the man I talked to feel like they had a shot with her. If you had asked me back in high school why it was that I so desired the romantic attentions of strange men on the internet, I couldn't have told you. I felt guilty about pretending to be someone I wasn't, and I never told anyone what I was doing on Omegle. Every time I logged off, I swore it would be my last time visiting that website. But I kept coming back because being Allison made me feel popular, powerful, and pretty. Three things I desperately wanted to feel as a lonely, confused teenager. Because women were in such short supply on Omegle, I could afford to be picky with who I spent my time on. A few things got to an immediate disconnect for me. Bad grammar, because I wasn't about to spend five minutes trying to decipher one message. One word responses, because I don't like having conversations with brick walls. And any signs of overt racism or homophobia. It being the internet, there was a lot of that. For every one man who could hold a decent conversation, there were ten quick disconnects. If it were late at night, I would sometimes grind through every Omegle user currently online about finding someone worth talking to. Like swiping left on every person in my area, except my area was the entire internet. <laughs> this all might make me sound fussy, but I really did give a chance to every man with a grasp on the English language. I remember one man who was actually very sweet, but who used an overbearing baby talk vocabulary that quickly began grating on me. I asked him to stop, and for some reason he got offended. But we talked it out. When we eventually disconnected, I realized that I had had a more honest, communicative relationship with that man than anyone I'd ever actually met in real life. What I was really looking for, though, was the occasional charming, funny, polite man who wanted nothing more in the world than a chance to talk with a pretty young woman. My favorites were the middle-aged men who stuck to an antiquated notion of chivalry, who would court me like a wealthy suitor in a Jane Austen novel. <laughs> Above all else, these men made me feel wanted. For the 20 or 30 minutes our conversation would last, I would feel like the most important person in the world to this man. Sometimes, if I liked a man enough, we would go beyond flirting and role-play a romantic or sexual encounter. With language as our only limitation, these scenes could get pretty ridiculous. Billion dollar dates at luxurious mansions, a tryst between a CEO and his secretary, the king of a mythical kingdom and his concubine. I went along with pretty much everything, knowing safety was only a button press away if things ever got out of hand. Though I would never admit it, what excited me more than anything else as a teenager was some man who I'd never meet describing himself sweeping me off my feet and into arms way more ripped than he actually probably had. <laughs> My life as Allison ran parallel to my life as an angry, confused teenage boy until I graduated from high school, when I entered into a long-term relationship with a woman whose trust I didn't want to betray by flirting with strange men online. Though I was able to stay off of Omegle, there was now a hole in my personality where Allison had once resided. If I was a straight man in a happy relationship with a woman, then why did I still feel so uncomfortable in my own body? It took a lot of time and introspection, as well as reading a lot of incomprehensible queer theory papers with titles like Abjection and the Hygienic Imagination. <laughs> to understand what I had really been doing on Omegle. By pretending to be a woman, I had been inviting men to treat me as a woman, which in turn reinforced my own latent feelings of femininity. Being Allison made me feel happy because, as a teenager, pretending to be a woman on the internet was the only way I knew how to express the femininity I wanted to embody in real life. It had nothing to do with wanting men. Rather, I wanted their masculinity so that I could feel more feminine. Last year, I came out as a femme. 
Not exactly a woman, but someone who is more feminine than masculine. I started exclusively wearing women's clothing, as well as jewelry and makeup. I no longer had to deal with all the self-hatred that had stemmed from the dysphoria of living as a man. I began to feel as popular, pretty, and powerful in my real life as I'd used to feel in my digital life. A lot of people are afraid of anonymity on the internet, since, yes, people can be pretty awful when they think that their actions won't have consequences. But in places like Omegle, where the only limitations are imagination and a Wi-Fi connection, anonymity is what allows people like me to try out new identities in ways that we just can't in real life. Allison was not me, but she was a proto-me, an experimental model of femininity that I would later adapt to fit my own personality. It took pretending to be someone else for me to find out who I truly was. Thank you. I cannot count how many times my mother has let viruses infect her computer. Every time I dislodge an invasive toolbar or cut out parasitic spyware, she thinks I'm a hero. <laughs> and yet, I still fell for it in one of the worst professional fuck-ups of my career. I was put in charge of managing my company's Facebook page, yet all it took was one of those basic your password must be reset phishing traps to lose it to some basement-dwelling hacker. I work as a writer for my company, a gear and apparel site, and during their early days in the e-commerce scene, they didn't have anyone running their social media accounts, so they gave me the job as a kind of a side gig. In startups, most employees wear multiple hats. They clearly should have given me just one hat. <laughs> the Facebook page melted away before my eyes. The profile picture changed to a troll face. My recent posts vanished one by one, the scammer changed the title for my company's name to Awesome Videos. <laughs> Even in my panic, I found it tragically unimaginative. <laughs> I reverted to what my mom always did when her computer wasn't working. I jammed the power button until the screen went black. <laughs> the sickening helplessness of cybercrime gripped me, a glimmer of which I wouldn't feel again until the Equifax hack years later. The computer rebooted. The Facebook page was gone. I got on the phone with our ad manager. We've been running thousands of dollars of ads, and it turns out only when Facebook's revenue is threatened do they, actual, do they offer actual customer support. As I waited on hold, I wondered if this page was even worth saving. Our followers, like our customers, lean politically to the right, hard right. Or if they don't, they certainly seem to, given social media's predilection to turning up the volume on the loudest assholes in the room. They're pro-war, pro-police, and pro-America. They have never forgotten 9-11. <laughs> I haven't either. I'm one of those Americans who still breathlessly talks about where I was on the day it happened. It was 10th grade Spanish class. In the high school years that followed, Bush-era country music convinced me we should tactically nuke the Middle East into a glass crater. Post-9-11 teenagers were so edgy back then. <laughs> Then I grew up and gained the kind of insufferable progressive wisdom that only comes with four years of college. You know, those super controversial beliefs like brown people are human beings and we should build middle schools instead of predator drones. <laughs> things, things like that. And here I remain to this day, a member of a mostly liberal group of employees working for a company that caters to a social media audience that still thinks and behaves like I did in high school. Keeping up a steady rhythm of engagement with this audience means they're more likely to respond to our ads. So I post content they'd appreciate. But that puts me in a dilemma. I want to be good at my job, but I don't want to boost the signal of bigotry and ignorance on the internet. So I play it safe, threading the needle between inflammatory and boring, straddling the fence between incel talking points and snowflake trigger warnings. I post viral videos of Keanu Reeves training at a gun range for the new John Wick movie, but I never post specifically about the Second Amendment. I share stories of military accomplishments, but nothing politically charged. A post about a hostage rescue mission is better than a post about a Navy SEAL charged with a war crime. I can post about Navy warships like the USS Jason Dunham, named after a heroic Marine, but I can't post about the USS Gabrielle Giffords, named after the Congresswoman who was shot in the head by a maniac. People of my political tribe are so often accused of being triggered, and yet the moment you post about a controversial warship, or incorrectly call a marine drill instructor a drill sergeant, you incur the wrath of those who ache for the opportunity to flex whatever the right-wing equivalent of being woke is. 
it's like using the wrong gendered pronoun on Twitter. You just don't do it. I'm also astonished at how fast certain posts go from being viral to downright evil. I learned this during my first few months on the job when Obama was still president. Back then, the Islamic State dominated the news, shocking people with the speed and ferocity of their expansion. But as the group started to lose manpower and territory, their pronouncements became obnoxious. The more of their bunkers the U.S. Air Force busted, the less relevant ISIS became, to the point where posts about them on social media became opportunities to poke fun at the adorable little jihadis who just wanted the world to pay attention to them. One example was when a news article made the rounds about some enterprising terrorist leader who promised to invade Washington, D.C. and raise the black flag of ISIS over the White House. It was laughable. I shared this article on the company's page. Who doesn't appreciate an opportunity to make fun of terrorists, right? It immediately took off. Laughing emojis and likes by the hundreds poured in. Then the comments, I'd love to see them try. Come at me, bro. That's cute. Hey, ISIS, just make sure Obama's daughters are home first. That quickly became the most liked comment, rising to the top of the post like an ice cube in a cool glass of hate. More comments of approval followed. Laughing emojis on comments advocating the death of children are unnerving. There's something even more disturbing about hundreds of them. But I don't feel unmotivated. Instead of despairing, I wage a kind of shadow war against them. Whatever small measure of influence I exert on the hard right probably can't even find the needle, much less move it. But I delude myself into thinking I'm helping the cause of progressives. When a military service member is awarded the Medal of Honor, I post about it. Our audience appetite for content aside, in my personal view, such achievements are worthy of recognition. But I choose the article exclusively based on the thumbnail image. If it's just the recipient proudly wearing the medal, I post it. But if it's a shot of the president clasping it over his shoulders, I don't. It's petty as hell, I know, but just let me have this, okay? Sometimes, despite my best efforts to avoid insane debates on my posts, a ferocious comment war will ignite. The rhetoric can be so enraging, so poisonous, that I personally burn with a desire to jump in, reply, and show them what's what. But that would get me fired quicker than, say, allowing the Facebook page to get hacked, so I don't. Instead, I rely on my friend Gary. I fire off a message to him with a link to the post. He drops his shit and he goes to work. <laughs> He's my proxy warrior, my avenging angel of social media discourse. A skilled debater, Gary airdrops into a hot LZ of hate and ignorance, unleashes logic on the enemy, and cripples his infrastructure. War is hell, but it can be beautiful to watch from the sidelines. Despite all this, I enjoy growing the community and furthering my company's goals. I'm proud to have written for them for six years. We've grown from a scrappy startup to a reputable e-commerce cage fighter that sometimes, sometimes, poaches sales from Amazon. I help this company find its voice, and running the Facebook page means more people hear it. Eventually, the Facebook ad manager got back on the phone with me. She pulled some strings and managed to reset and return the page, and also saved me from being fired. I had the page back. Posting has now become routine. I know what to share, but more importantly, I know what not to share, like the recent protests. I'd rather not give oxygen to whatever incendiary comments would surely appear on those posts. So instead, I posted about our recent sales and promotions. But depending on how recent the latest mass shooting or Trump rally was, the difficulty of the job fluctuates. I grow tired of this audience's dated obsession with some kind of classic country that no longer exists, or perhaps never did. A hostile and uninviting land of nationalist values where racism is confused with patriotism and where people devote themselves to expired notions of what it means to be American. It's a land that exists in the broken HTML formatting of those horribly bigoted emails your uncle forwards you from that one guy he knows at church. <laughs> it's a land where people ask, was it really necessary to have that gay couple in the new Star Wars movie? It's a land where people believe, where they truly believe, that nothing is actually wrong with our country right now, that everything's how it's supposed to be. But there was something recently that gave me a glimmer of hope. A few weeks ago was a nationally designated day called Military Spouse Appreciation Day. 
It was a fun opportunity to put together a photo album featuring images of military wives and husbands, of homecomings, of farewells, and joy. I gathered a handful of photos. The wife of an A-10 pilot embracing her mustachioed man on the tarmac. A marine hugging his wife before leaving for deployment. A soldier clasping his wife's hand as their daughter heaved his gigantic duty bag over her little shoulders. Then I grabbed one more photo. A female sailor standing at parade rest as her wife pinned her collar and cap device, the rank of chief petty officer, on her service khaki lapel. Her cheeks were flushed with happiness as she smiled at her love, overjoyed to have her at her side during her promotion. I added the photo of the same-sex couple along with all the rest and posted it on the company's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I even shared it on LinkedIn. Then I braced myself for the wave of inappropriate comments that would follow. But it never came. No one said a word. Thank you. That was Blame It on the Internet. Um, before y'all take off to So Say We All's website to check it all out and uh, perhaps throw a few bucks their way, I just want to mention So Say We All is a community, um, not just among its performers and volunteers and board members, but also its audience. Um, so in that, we, we sh I'd love to share our experiences with you and we want to hear yours. Uh, the arts help make San Diego a city we all want to live in. So if you're digging this and you're interested in sharing a story, the theme for July is going to be really awesome and uh, great for summer. It is Amuse Me, Theme Parks and Games. Uh, it's scheduled for July 23rd. You have a few days to submit. We want you to tell us about your true experiences with games, theme parks, carnivals, Interpret the theme however you like. That's the beauty of VAMP. Uh, so that is so sosayweallonline.com. It's also a great place to read about the fantastic workshops and partnerships that this amazing organization um, puts forth for our city. And so with that, I want to thank our performers and our coaches. We had Jennifer Stiff, Dallas McLaughlin, Brandy Ducusin, Lauren Cusatello, Justin Hudnall, and Ari Remmel, who helped our performers. And again, our awesome performers, Rory Kelly, yeah. first timer Kiyomi Kishaba, yeah. Dallas McLaughlin, Florence Sarah Pollard, Brienne Hayes, and Brent Hanapy. Thank you so much for coming through the magic of the internet, and please join us again. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's a wrap. That's a wrap. Yay. Yay.